and depending on where you are. Um, so it's really um, nice to have you guys here today at our regular China Institute um, webinar. So my name is Huanzhou. I'm a reader in international management at the School of Finance and Management at SOAS. Um, I'm very delighted that we will have a fantastic seminar today, which will be given by an excellent international business scholar, um, Professor Shemin Prashantham, if I pronounced the um, name correctly. Um, now, before I introduce him and the subject, let me remind you that for the webinar, you are more than welcome to raise questions or comments through the Q&A box, which is at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Um, if you would like to raise the question anonymously, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, but if you can actually um, provide a little bit of information about who you are, um, that will be really helpful to, um, for giving me certain kinds of better sense of your questions and picking questions to the speaker. Um, but your wish will be respected, neither your name or other things which will identify your identity will not be disclosed at all. So now let me actually give kinds of introduction, but I think, you know, um, it's not going to really describe as comprehensively as uh, Professor um, Prashen Hansom um, is about because he has been working in international business and strategy over the past decades. And currently he's the professor at China Europe International Business School in Shanghai. And then before joining, Seeps, and he also taught at Nottingham University Business School in China and the University of Glasgow. So he does have a good relationship, you know, with the UK academic community. So as you have already focused or seen the title of for, um, today's talk, and then he is the person who actually put forward the idea of dancing with glory, gorillas, which talking about partnership between large corporations and startups. And then his work, not just as based on the perspective, but also based on, on his field work and insights um, by talking and by you know, researching those large corporations and also the small new ventures. So like I said, um, it will be our honor to have him today and for the next one and a half hour to talk about his research because his research has been widely published in high impact journals, such as Journal of Business Venturing, Journal of International Business Study, so on and so forth. Um, if you are quite familiar with international business and entrepreneurship, and you're sure that his work has been read and you know, um, appreciated by both the academic community and also the practitioners. Um, he will show you um, the latest book, The Gorillas Can Dance Lesson from Microsoft and other corporations on partnering with startups because this book definitely offers lots of managerial implications on both in large corporations, but also in small startups about how this kinds of partnership can deliver value um, for both sides. Um, so today we would like to hear what his research about and his insight is about. Now I will hand over to um, him for the presentation and then we will come back with the Q&A for some inspiring and exciting conversation on this topic. Now, the floor is yours, Shemin. Thank you so much, uh, Juan, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's wonderful to join you from Shanghai. Uh, just a couple of things uh, to make clear at the start. Um, this is not going to be uh, exclusively a China uh, talk. This is going to be about this phenomenon of large companies partnering with startups. Uh, China features um, a fair bit in my work, uh, but this was a study that was done on a global basis. So I just wanna clarify that. Uh, also to say that um, I've written a lot for academic audiences and I've written also for practitioner audiences in outlets like uh, Sloan Management Review or Harvard Business Review. And this book is uh, in the latter category. It's written for uh, more of an academic uh, of practitioner audience. It's underpinned by a lot of academic research. So the presentation that I will make um, is based on uh, this book, which is uh, predominantly written for uh, an academic uh, audience. So now is the moment of truth where I discover whether I can uh, share my screen uh, properly. Uh, just give me half a tick. Oh, 
Okay, well, so hopefully you're seeing a slide with the, the, the image of my book. Uh, Juan, you, are you seeing that? Okay, so great. So, so the title of my presentation is the title of my book, Gorillas Can Dance Lessons from Microsoft and Other Corporations on Partnering with Startups. Um, and um, this is something I've worked on for over a decade and a half now. In 2005, I graduated with a PhD uh, from Strathclyde University in Scotland. So this is me um, on the 4th of July, 2005. Um, uh, so it's as all the academics in the audience know, uh, that's a very important day when you graduate with your PhD. And uh, that same day after the ceremony, we had a, a, a meal to celebrate and this is my PhD supervisor, Stephen Young. Uh, Stephen Young passed away last autumn. He was a scholar scholar and uh, people like uh, Juan who know the international business community in the UK well will know that uh, Steve Young uh, was, was a, a pillar of the UK IB community. Uh, along with his co-author, Neil Hood, uh, Hood and Young were a very prolific um, scholarly duo uh, with very complementary capabilities. In fact, Neil Hood had one foot in academia, one foot in policy and ended up uh, being the vice chair of the of Scottish Enterprise, the Economic Development Agency of Scotland, uh, while Steve uh, was very much a purist um, academic. One of the things that they got to study over the years was how large multinational enterprises were operating in Scotland, particularly American companies like IBM that had established a subsidiary, you know, about four decades ago. This was after Europe had rebuilt, thanks to the Marshall Plan. American companies were coming into Europe and using the UK as a beachhead for entering uh, the rest of Europe. Commercial offices typically uh, in the Southeast or in, in the London area where most of you are based, I guess, and manufacturing facilities in Scotland. And these uh, scholars studied how these large multinational subsidiaries evolved over time. Some of them tried to become more entrepreneurial, do more in innovation and so on. I was about the fifth or sixth in a line of PhD students who joined from the second half of the 1990s onwards looking at the internationalization of smaller entrepreneurial firms. And about the time I graduated, um, as I was looking ahead to, you know, building up my research portfolio, I was asking, why do we look at these two sets of firms in parallel? Is there not scope for them to work together and for us to study the interactions between these companies? And as it happened, Neil Hood, uh, who, as I said, was vice chair of Scottish Enterprise, he said, well, it's funny you should say this because we are trying to help the likes of IBM who have been around for a while and now trying to do more innovation as opposed to manufacturing to connect with our very talented smaller entrepreneurial firms here in Scotland. And, uh, and, and those companies would love to partner with these big companies and have access to their scale and commercialize their innovation in the process. And so uh, one of the first, uh, uh, articles I wrote on this phenomenon was based on this policy initiative in Scotland. It was published in a journal called International Business Review in 2006. And then in 2008, I published the article that um, was sort of my first major success as an academic. It was published in a journal called California Management Review, which is a little bit of a hybrid of an academic and a practitioner journal and was called Dancing with Gorillas. And this was from the point of view of the smaller company talking about how they may engage with big companies. And I had a few cases in Scotland, a few cases in Asia. Um, and uh, the reason for the title is I had met an eminent strategy professor uh, about the time I was getting interested in this phenomenon in 2006 at a conference called the Academy of Management Conference. And I mentioned to him what I was discovering in, in Scotland and so on, and he said, I think many of these smaller companies have no choice but to learn to dance with the big gorilla. So dancing with gorillas became a phrase I lashed onto um, and had this piece with Julian Birkinshaw of London Business School, a California Management Review. 
Uh, and then over time, I uh, kept trying to conceptualize this more. I worked with a professor called Peter Buckley, who is also a very important international business scholar. Uh, and um, we talked about this as a division of entrepreneurial labor between larger companies and, and, and smaller companies, the large companies um, being good at exploiting their existing capabilities and smaller companies being able to explore new capabilities and together they're able to do more that they can do together. Uh, I also um, collaborated with George Yip um, and we talked more about how this phenomenon was unfolding in emerging markets like China and India. And uh, I, I joined forces with Julian 12 years after our 2008 article for this uh, 2020 article in Jibs. Uh, where we try to sort of consolidate all the things that we would, had observed over time, but also add the idea that these partnerships could be useful for the sustainable development goals. So as I said, my presentation and the way the book is written is mainly for a practitioner audience, but before getting there, I just thought I'd give you a flavor of the underpinning academic work, uh, and now I'll get into the actual um, the summary of the, the key ideas from the book. And the company that I've had the pleasure of uh, studying for a very long time, the lead case study, if you will, in the book is Microsoft. Um, in fact, Microsoft was famously referred to as by Steve Jobs as a company that was good at uh, partnering. He once said Microsoft's one of the few companies we were able to partner with that actually worked for both companies. Bill Gates and Microsoft were really good at it because they didn't make the whole thing in the early days and they learned how to partner with people really well. But you know, like many large companies, Microsoft had learned how to partner with other large companies. For even for Microsoft, they had to go through a process of learning how to engage uh, with startups. And this began at the turn of the century when Steve Ballmer hired Dana Lewin who helped to establish uh, the Microsoft campus in Silicon Valley and began a process of engaging with the startup ecosystem there. And back then in 2001, Microsoft had made a major strategic decision to go into enterprise software, meaning software that other companies would use. And they had created something called the .NET platform. And so they wanted other software companies to build software products on top of their underlying platform technology. And the business model was simple. Each time the software partner would sell a license of its software, the underlying um, technology of Microsoft would be sold. But they realized that they would also need startups to come because they, they needed the energy, the dynamism of startups. They also realized that Microsoft was a bit of an outsider in Silicon Valley. So Daniel Lewin, who as a young man had worked with Steve Jobs in Apple and had started a couple of uh, ventures in Silicon Valley, uh, was the face of Microsoft in uh, Silicon Valley. And it took him about seven years before in 2008, Microsoft launched its first startup specific partnering program called BizSpark. Uh, followed it up uh, with a more exclusive version of this because thousands of startups joined BizSpark uh, to avail of the free software tools that were on offer. And they created this exclusive version of, of the program called BizSpark One, where 100 startups among these thousands, the 100 most innovative startups were given the opportunity to work closely with Microsoft. These were all very top-down efforts coming down from headquarters but it also inspired managers in other parts of Microsoft, like Zach Weisfeld, who was a Microsoft manager in Israel and felt, oh, we are the startup nation. We should also play an active role in this. And so he actually experimented with a new format without the blessing of headquarters, as happens sometimes in subsidiaries, um, and created an accelerator whereby startups could work with Microsoft for four months. And when headquarters got wind of this idea, they thought it was great. And actually, uh, Zach then spoke to his counterparts in China and India. And so in 2012, on the heels of the accelerator in Tel Aviv, uh, an accelerator in Microsoft uh, Beijing, um, in, they have this facility in Zhongwen Sun uh, and, uh, and one in Bangalore were established. And this is 
Satya Nadella, who at the time in 2012, when these accelerators were being set up, he was the president of one of the business divisions in Microsoft who was driving cloud computing. And as you know very well, I'm sure startups uh, have been able to develop much faster because of cloud computing. They no longer have to have a high fixed cost for a technology infrastructure they're able to use uh, to pay as they go, or, you know, to use software on tap, as it were. And so you see this guy who was championing cloud computing was very relevant to startups. And after he became CEO saying, Microsoft loves startups. And this is James Chaw, who runs uh, Microsoft for startups in China, pretty much saying the same thing. So over time, you saw this big, mighty company that at one time had this major problem of being a one trick pony. They were fantastic in the PC world, then struggled as the world changed and moved towards the mobile internet, found its footing again, particularly through cloud computing. And all the while was um, improving how it engaged with startups and did so uh, around the world. So this story, which is what the, opening uh, prologue in my book uh, tells us that even a technology giant can face disruption. And so the way in which the startup partnering was aligning with the evolving strategy suggests that it's important to think about the why. Why would a big company engage with startups? Uh, the manner in which they experimented in different ways to work with, co-create with startups speaks to the how. And the fact that they did this in different parts of the world suggests there's also a useful spatial dimension. We should also consider the where. So I've used this as the basis for my book and the way I've structured it. So there are a couple of chapters on each of these, and I'll give you uh, just a very brief idea of what I talk about in each. So let me start with the why. And the starting point is very straightforward. Entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship is relevant to large companies too. And this, as you know very well, um, is because, you know, what makes big companies successful as they develop and grow can also be a little bit of a liability as it becomes apparent that they need to change. And so finding ways to be more proactive, more innovative, be willing to take risks is something that um, not just startups need to consider, but also big companies. And the starting point is often uh, as Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School talked about disruptive innovation. Startups on the outside, entrepreneurs in startups can pose a bit of a headache to managers and big companies by coming up with alternative solutions, uh, different ways in which these big companies are disrupted. Amazon disrupted uh, the, the traditional booksellers, uh, Netflix uh, disrupted the traditional uh, video rental companies and so on. And so for managers, often this, the trigger to be more entrepreneurial is they're seeing startups on the outside posing challenges to them. And uh, digitalization is of course accelerated this. So, so entrepreneurs pursuing opportunities that help them to uh, challenge what incumbents are doing through business model innovation. They adopt, uh, become part of ecosystems and of course have a much more nimble culture. But as I said, being entrepreneurial isn't just for startups, it's something big companies around the world have recognized. And so managers seek to be entrepreneurial. And in some cases, they do so by seeking to uh, institute intrapreneurship. This is a term that's been in and out of fashion over the past three decades. It's basically about how can we within a big company do things entrepreneurial, uh, create new business opportunities, um, and when I teach this in class, I often use uh, the three M post-it notes case um, because this is a legendary example of intrapreneurship. Uh, many of you probably know the story of how a scientist called Silver Spencer uh, was part of a project uh, to develop a new adhesive that actually failed, uh, but he was very fascinated by the semi-sticky substance in his spare time during lunch breaks, he'd go around doing brown bag seminars for other colleagues to tell them about this new product and to ask for ideas of how it could be used. And eventually after a few years, someone from the marketing department who used to sing in a choir uh, said, 
you know, it's so frustrating when the bookmark keeps slipping from the hymn book, maybe I can use the semi-sticky substance to make a semi-permanent bookmark. Uh, and that resulted in, in the posted notes. And 3 ms have, have sought to institutionalize this by allowing employees to have 15% of their time to work on uh, side projects that could benefit the company. And I think this remains very important. But in addition, you're also seeing intrapreneurs, and you saw a few examples like Dana Lewin and James Chaw, Zach Weisfeld at Microsoft, who are seeking to connect their companies with entrepreneurship on the outside. In other words, they are seeking as managers to connect with entrepreneurs. Uh, and indeed, even the more classic intrapreneurship type programs are recognizing the, the value of engaging with, with startups. Kapil Kane is Director of Innovation at Intel China in Shanghai. And he, was, he has been running something called the GrowthX Intrapreneurship Program for Intel employees uh, to encourage them to come up with new ideas using Intel technology, which they then help to commercialize. And one of their projects using Intel camera technology uh, to create a smart door um, solution whereby you smile at the door and the door opens. One of their business units was going to take nine months to bring this to market. And then they discovered um, a startup in Hangzhou called LifeMart, which showed interest to work with Intel and took it to market in three months. And so even in these classic entrepreneurship programs, there can be scope to work with startups. And the broad recognition is, there's a scope for a win-win. On the one hand, each side has something that the other would like. The large corporations have resources, legitimacy, scale. The startups have creativity and agility. On paper, it sounds like a match made in heaven, but if it was so easy to work together, then a lot of companies would be doing this very successfully and there would be no need for my book. But in fact, what I found is that there's something that you might think of as, the, as a paradox of asymmetry, which, which means that partnering with startups isn't easy. Jeremy Bassett, who founded Unilever Foundry in London, uh, says it's very difficult for a large organization to stimulate the same sort of incentives and flexibility that exists for an entrepreneur. We come from this background of plan and perfect. We research things very well. When we launch things, we really invest in them. This is the antithesis of what is needed in an entrepreneurial environment. In other words, even though big companies have good intentions and seek to be entrepreneurial, they are fundamentally different from startups. And um, in a sense, as I say, this is a bit of a paradox in that the very differences that big corporations and startups attracted to each other also make it difficult, or at least not straightforward, to partner with each other. And these asymmetries are of at least three forms. One is the asymmetry of goals. Big companies and startups want different things and at different timescales. There's asymmetry of structure. Finding role counterparts in two big companies is relatively straightforward. A vice president of marketing can talk to their counterpart. Much more difficult when a startup and a big company are, are engaging with each other. And an asymmetry of attention, which is to say that big companies see an ocean of startups out there with fancy PowerPoint uh, decks and, and names, and they can't tell which ones are worthy of their attention. The startups know which companies, big companies are out there, but they struggle to get the attention of the people that matter. And so the, in terms of the how, and now we're moving to the second part, um, what I've observed across time and space in different parts of the world, across different industries, consciously or otherwise, uh, the companies that are doing this well in terms of engaging with startups have unpacked these asymmetries and found ways in which to address them. And that uh, leads me to thinking about this systematic way of engaging with startups. Uh, and this is a threefold process uh, to address uh, each of the three asymmetries. The first of which is clarifying the synergy. The second of which is creating interfaces. And the third of which is cultivating exemplars. Uh, the synergy uh, piece helps to address goal asymmetry, the interface structure asymmetry, and exemplars attention asymmetry. So uh, let me talk to each of these in turn. Now, when it comes to the synergy, everybody talks about win-win. 
Uh, and it might seem blindingly obvious for me to say this, but it's important to clarify what the win on either side is. And you'd be surprised at how fuzzy this can be. And at a broad uh, uh, level of, of conceptualization, we can think of two major synergies. One uh, that I call building block synergies and the other pain point synergies. And I've sort of described the building block synergies already when I was talking about Microsoft, especially information technology companies have these technology building blocks that they want startups to come and build solutions on. And when the solutions are sold, the underlying uh, technology of the big company is sold as well. It's a very straightforward win-win of revenue sharing. Uh, and so the big company has an incentive to co-sell solutions developed by startups, especially if they are very innovative and effective and have a good market. And in this way, startups are more likely to get traction in the market. But there are also uh, companies from traditional industries. I mentioned Unilever already, but there are companies in the automotive industry, for example, like BMW and Nissan, uh, banking companies like Barclays. I mean, just across a range of industries, companies that over the past uh, half a decade or so have really um, uh, sought to come to grips with the need to digitalize, but found that they have pain points uh, and so look for solutions and, and startups therefore can help to address their pain points. And these companies can become important clients to these startups, not in an arm's length uh, exchange relationship, but because digitalization is strategic important, importance as strategic partners. And so the win is that you sell, the, from the startup's point of view, you sell to the corporation. From the corporation's point of view, they're able to adopt these technologies early and quickly and get customized solutions. In terms of the interface, and here I'm talking about specific entities that can be a startup's first port of call when they're trying to engage with big companies. So in BMW, it's called BMW Startup Garage. Uh, in Nissan, they had something called Infinity Labs, particularly focused on their luxury brand, Infinity. In the case of Unilever, I've already mentioned Unilever Foundry. And so these very specific identifiable interfaces where there are managers whose KPIs, key performance indicators, include having to talk to startups. Uh, there are two broad types I've observed, one that I call cohorts and the other funnels. And uh, I say to my MBA class, the, the MBA class is like a cohort. You know, getting it is difficult, but once you get in, everybody who gets in more or less completes the process. You have a fixed period of time to be together, structured around a curriculum, and peer interaction is an important part of the process. Corporate accelerators are a good example of this. Microsoft pioneered this uh, nearly a decade ago, as I mentioned, in Israel, China, and India, and then set of acceler accelerations in other parts of the world, including in London. Um, by contrast, the funnel is like the job search process after an MBA. So many fewer finish the process than begin. Uh, candidates get screened out in stage gates as you go along, and you may not know who else is part of the process. So SAP, which is also a big IT company, when they set up their first startup partnering initiative in 2015, chose to do this out of Palo Alto, California, even though they're a German company. But this was a funnel approach. If you, were as, you as a startup wanted to build on top of say their HANA technology platform, uh, you could submit your prototypes to SAP. These would be rigorously uh, reviewed by a team of uh, engineers in Germany. About 40% would then go through to the next stage where the commercial arm would then rigorously screen these startups. And in the end, about 10, 15% of the original ones would get go-to-market support. And so this, is a different approach. Each one uh, has its pros and cons. The cohorts, the accelerators, for example, are good for serendipity, um, unexpected um, uh, collaborations may occur. Two startups that didn't know each other from Adam may form a three-way partnership with the big company. Um, the funnels are good for predictability and uh, it's, easy, it's, it's easier to have predefined goals and then search for startups that help to achieve these goals. But what I find most distinctive of the companies that do this effectively, that is partner with startups, is that they make an effort early on to cultivate success stories. 
And by showcasing these exemplars or success stories, they're able to attract more high quality startups in the way that a business school with a famous alumni is able to attract other good students. But also increasingly, I find that's very important to persuade internal audiences within the big company who might be skeptical. Because you see the person who's in Unilever Foundry, it's his or her job to talk to the startups, but they can only give startups meaningful collaborative projects if people in the business units, brand managers, for example, are willing to do this and brand managers may be risk averse. So by seeing what's possible, uh, with other startups, they may be more inclined to do this. Also, startups may be worried that big companies may take undue advantage of them. And then by seeing these success stories, A, they have a better idea of what success can look like and have realistic expectations, uh, have a better idea of which gorillas are worth dancing with, but also will have more confidence to proceed and exert their attention and attract the attention of startups. But there's another piece to the how, and that is not only is it important to identify the, 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 the partnering process, a systematic way involving a synergy interface and exemplar. For big companies that want to do this on a regular basis, they need to, need to embed this within the company as a partnering capability and a distinct one, distinct from their ability to partner with other similar large companies. And for this, it's a process that involves, first of all, initiating uh, startup partnering, then expanding it, and then finally systematizing or institutionalizing it within the company. For, and, and this, of course, takes genuine effort. It can be a painful learning process, but it's important for companies that are serious about winning the hearts and minds of startups. And what I've observed in terms of initiation is that entrepreneurial individuals play a very key role uh, and often um, find ways in which to make a start. In some cases, it could even happen by piggybacking on an existing initiative. So when Walmart in China a couple of years ago decided to engage with startups, they actually went to Microsoft who have an accelerator and said, can we talk to some of your startup alumni uh, and the cohort of Microsoft fed this new program called Omega 8, which is very much a funnel, um, and helped them accelerate the process of searching for startups. And it suited Microsoft as well, because it was in their interest for their startup alumni to work with big companies, because in the process, they would be using Microsoft technology more and more. So getting started, as Simon Sinek said, think big, start small, but start. And I think uh, for many companies, getting that initial step going is, is often challenging. In Israel, when Microsoft's uh, Zach Weisfeld got that corporate accelerator going, that was an example of initiating getting started as well. However, if companies want to then uh, make this, um, and, and sorry, this picture on the, uh, that you see now is of Gregor Gimme, who is one of the co-founders of BMW Startup Garage. And he said, my philosophy has always been seek uh, forgiveness rather than permission. And even in a, a fairly traditional industry like automotive, he said he um, got things going and initiated it. But that's not gonna be enough for companies that want to take this um, to, to really institutionalize this. They will have to expand it, do this time and again. Shilpa Patel was um, uh, helped to set up the, the Nissan program for Infinity, it's the luxury brand of Nissan, which is headquartered in Hong Kong. Uh, they did an, a, an accelerator and she found that she had to actually engage not just with the startups on the outside, but also people on the inside to win their support and working with senior managers, top managers, make sure that she had their commitment and buy-in and support. So for example, getting the CEO to write about this startup accelerator program in his newsletter, thereby signaling that this was important uh, and also getting on board peer middle managers in business units who would then be willing to give meaningful projects. In other words, this expansion piece is about spanning boundaries within the organization and outside. And over time, I've heard many people like Shilpa saying that actually engaging with startups on the outside is the easier part of the job. 
because once startups know that a big company is, is serious, they are quite happy to engage with the big companies. But actually, it's, it's harder work on the inside, getting people on board, and this becomes important. She was able to get the program in Hong Kong repeated on an annual basis, but also had additional programs established in Singapore and uh, Canada. And finally, um, companies that are serious about this systematize this and make this very consistent with their core strategy. This is something I saw in Bayer, the German pharmaceutical company, Hesus Del Val, who you see um, on the screen, uh, started this as what he calls a passion project in 2012. And this is the getting started bit. He, he just gave, a, gave small bits of money to students and said, can you come up with mobile phone apps. So this was 2012, right? Mobile internet is young and new. Um, and then in 2013, he went, well, why does it just have to be students? It can be startups in Germany. And then the following year, but why does it have to be startups in Germany? It can be startups from anywhere in the world. And then from 2016 onwards, he encouraged uh, Moscow, uh, the, the Russian subsidiary, the Spanish subsidiary, the Chinese subsidiary to also run these programs. And by 2018, it had become so big that they actually made this a very systematic program with three pillars. And they replaced Hezus because they felt now at this point, you actually need a very different type of manager to be managing this. And they brought in, in fact, a more senior person and had this very much aligned with um, the core strategy of the company. And of course, nowadays, uh, there's scope to engage with third-party specialists. For many years, Barclays, for example, worked with this company called Techstars to help set up their corporate accelerators. And my point, therefore, is now this partnering capability, startup partnering capability, is, has come to be viewed as something distinctive. Finally, let me just quickly talk uh, through the, the, the geographic part. Uh, big, um, multinationals in particular have scope to engage with startups around the world uh, and in different formats that Microsoft tried out over time, um, they kept engaging with different parts of the world, starting with the West and then going to emerging markets. Uh, and here my message is that uh, what I've observed is that companies like Microsoft that engage with startups in different parts of the world have learned how to uh, adapt or adjust what they do in different parts of the world. So, and when you deal with startups, it's often in a subnational region. I mean, a, a country like Israel or Singapore may be small enough to refer to the Israel ecosystem of the Singapore startup ecosystem. But when you're dealing with the United Kingdom or China, it's, it, it tends to be much more at a subnational region. And so the default setting is often the high reputation locations, the innovation clusters in advanced markets like um, Silicon Valley or the Thames Valley region. Here you find a critical mass of both the big companies and startups, and it's relatively straightforward to engage with in the ways we've been talking about. But in these smaller uh, places that are less well known for technology entrepreneurship, like Glasgow, for example, the, it becomes more difficult because you lack a critical mass of startups and big companies. And here the role of policy, public policy actors becomes important. And I've already referred to Scottish enterprise. And I would argue that these actors have to be entrepreneurial too. In this case in Scotland, they set up this bespoke policy measure to connect the likes of IBM or Sun Microsystems with local startups. They acted as an honest broker and they were able to, uh, to, to serve both a matchmaking function and also facilitated role in the collaboration. But now moving to emerging markets, and this would be of particular interest to the, those of you with an interest in China. So as you know, uh, China has some incredible innovation clusters like in Zhongwen Sun, especially around software, Shenzhen around hardware. And in these kinds of areas too, it's possible for big companies to partner with startups. Although there is some adaptation that's needed of the partnering practices they would have in Silicon Valley or London, largely because on the one hand, there's a lot of appetite for entrepreneurship, but these are still relatively immature ecosystems. Of course, by now, China has rapidly matured, uh, but still in terms of, uh, you, you're more likely to find a first time entrepreneur in China or India than in Israel or Silicon Valley. Also in terms of experience with enterprise relationships with big companies, this is still relatively, in relatively uh, terms, um, a new experience. Of course, China has these amazing B2C 
unicorns that we're all familiar with, but in the enterprise space, uh, it's uh, in relative terms, more nascent compared to Israel or Silicon Valley. Uh, and so it's possible here, but um, needs some adaptation. And for me, the most fascinating of these uh, cases is Nimbo. Nimbo has a great tradition of entrepreneurship, just not for technology entrepreneurship, uh, as compared to say Hangzhou in Zhejiang province. But even here, I've seen examples of IBM partnering with local startups. And that's because as in Scotland, Policymakers had to play an important role to, to, to connect these big companies and startups. But unlike Scotland, it happened in a less sort of explicit way where they had bespoke policy measures. Instead, they very cleverly used existing policy measures like the Smart City program uh, to connect these companies. And what they said was, we will split the entire Smart City pie into a small number of pretty big sizable chunks smart logistics, because it's a port city, smart education, smart healthcare, et cetera. And we'll give the entire piece to just one company. And all of a sudden the deal size was big enough that big companies were interested. IBM got the first contract after tendering for smart logistics. But the other part of the cunning plan was they knew that no single company can deliver the entire project. They would have to work with local companies for implementation. And they also knew that these local companies in a city like Ningbo would be smaller entrepreneurial firms. And in this way, IBM ended up working with a, a small startup called Smarter Logistics, which in turn was also able to bring in other small startups to contribute various components for the first pilot that uh, IBM had. Uh, and also over in the last few years, pre-pandemic, I've been able to visit a small campus that my school has in Accra, Ghana, and been observing how uh, these Western multinationals like Microsoft and IBM are engaging with startups there, but also how entrepreneurs in Africa are looking to the East and to China, for example, for inspiration uh, and finding that they can actually relate a little bit more with uh, emerging market uh, multinationals and are seeking to learn from them too. Very finally, when we also take a global perspective, and this is something I learned particularly from my work in Africa, there can be scope for these kind of partnerships to be a force for good, to contribute to the SDGs, to in a sense be part of SDG 17, which is partnerships for the goals. Uh, and by taking the same um, process that we've been discussing, the synergy, the interface and the exemplars, but broadening it to fit societal concerns. So for example, looking at synergy, not just as a win-win, but as a win, win, win. Also looking at, at, at uh, scope um, to address SDGs. To have an interface that also includes non-traditional actors like the United Nations or NGOs like Reach for Change, which in Ghana is playing the role that a company like Techstars played for Barclays in New York and London, but there's no Techstars in Africa uh, or Impact Hub, which is a social enterprise platform. These additional types of entities can be very useful and important in connecting big companies and startups. And often it's not, not just the big companies in terms of their corporate arms, but also in terms of their foundations. And most importantly, the, the exemplars are hybrid in the sense that they have economic payoffs, but also social benefit, SDG3, uh, health has become very important during the pandemic. Cloud Physician is a startup in Bangalore partnering with Cisco that offers remote support for intensive care units in hospitals, particularly in smaller towns. And they had an important role to play when India had a horrible second wave of COVID in May last year. In terms of clean water and sanitation, Kusini is a startup in South Africa that develops uh, water filters uh, using frugal innovation, and they have partnered with DHL to uh, install their facilities in 50 hard to reach places in South Africa. And of course, climate change now, um, arguably the most important issue facing the world. Budweiser in China, working with a Chinese startup called Mitero to turn some of their uh, beer can waste into uh, eco friendly materials. And just before the pandemic, Microsoft announced the launch of their global social entrepreneurship program. Uh, which sort of also uh, echoes this importance. And finally, whether or not you're interested in startups or big companies, I think the broad message that I have, uh, uh, that I think this work uh, suggests in terms of the why, how, and where 
of uh, partnering is that it relates to some important mindsets. The why relates to entrepreneurial mindsets, the how to the collaborative mindset, and the where to the global mindset. And of course, this applies in the relatively narrow context that I've been talking about, but surely also more broadly to organizational transformation, as well as more generally for social impact. Um, and as Paul Polman, the former CEO of Unilever says, it's imperative for large organizations to partner with more nimble startups to help create a better world. Uh, and that's what I hope this book will play a small role in contributing towards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shemay, for your very insightful and lots of storytelling based on your interviews and also your first-hand collected data. So I'll start out because I think it's really, you know, um, in the heart of my research area as well, talking about this kind of entrepreneurial behavior, especially talking about the global mindset, because we have seen such a global connected um, community where more and more small business actually have been embedded into this kinds of big partnership or what we call entrepreneurial ecosystem, that they have to work with the large corporations. Um, but in your discussion, your particular focus on more hardcore, right, about a strategic vision about the corporate governance, how about the soft side? Because we all know the small and medium-sized firm, entrepreneurial firm, they do have a different outlook of their cultural perspective. And also the power imbalance between and the two sides in this kind of didactic relationship definitely matter. So what's your insight? So great question. Um, and I've written a lot in the past from the perspective of the smaller company. So Dancing with Gorillas was very much the the take for the startups and the book is written for, for, for people in the big companies. Uh, and my opening comment is actually, when startups have a better understanding of where the big companies are coming from, it can help them uh, to, to partner better. So for example, um, when we wrote the paper in 2008 called Dancing with Gorillas with, with Julian Birkinshaw, we talked about how this is a process, not an event. So the smaller company should try to form a relationship, uh, consolidate the relationship, and, uh, and then extend the relationship. And then as I studied what big companies were doing more and more, I realized that actually what I was discovering in terms of synergy, interface, and exemplar is exactly what the startup knowingly or unknowingly is responding to when it does those three steps that we had talked about, the forming, consolidating, and extending. So I think by understanding the nature of the synergy that the big company has on offer, then the startup can decide how to form the relationship uh, by understanding what the interface is, that gives them the basis for consolidating it. Uh, and then uh, if they're able to become an exemplar, then there's scope to extend it. Uh, so that's what I would uh, uh, begin by saying. But uh, you make a very, very good observation uh, that from the smaller company's point of view in particular, there's a power asymmetry. And uh, so, and, and, and a lot of this comes down to people in the end, right? Though we talk about companies working together, it, it, a lot of it comes down to, to people. And by the way, the companies that are doing this well, I think uh, are making a strong effort to have people working at the interface in the big companies who have an empathy for startups. And in some cases, when big companies uh, acquire a startup, I know you've done a lot of work on acquisitions, they end up actually getting some entrepreneurs within the company. You know, the people who used to run those startups and are willing to hang around for maybe a couple of years. And sometimes those people become very effective to use in these interface entities. Um, but coming back to the startups perspective, so because of the power asymmetry, the advice that I give to startups is when they form, consolidate, and extend the relationship, they need to do two things at the same time, which sounds contradictory, but they have to, to hold these contradictions in their head. And that is to be optimistic and pessimistic in equal, or not, not necessarily equal, those, but, but in, in, in parallel. And what I mean by that is, so when you're forming the relationship, you understand what the synergy is, of course, the startup needs to put its best foot forward, be proactive, find ways in which to get connected. But at the same time, uh, there needs to be a little bit of caution 
uh, to make sure to ascertain that the big company is serious, at least prima facie, to be exploring these partnerships. So for example, if BMW is saying, we're interested to engage with startups in cybersecurity, see whether cybersecurity is indeed of strategic importance to BMW. And in this case, it won't be difficult to ascertain that it is true and that it's an area of relative weakness for BMW. So you go, ah, so, you know, at least they seem to be serious. But the other thing is also, if you're operating with say BMW in China, to see, are they really committed to China? Do they have a long-term commitment here? Uh, are they, uh, or, or is, are they just really using this as a way to understand what's going on? In terms of consolidating the relationship, again, in terms of the, the, the proactive, putting your best forward side of things, startups need to align what they're doing with their core strength. So what sometimes happens is startups are talking to big companies, and then they're given an opportunity that's sort of tangential to what they're really good at. Um, and sometimes they're tempted to take this because you know, it gets your foot in the door. And I think that type of thinking makes sense in certain contexts, but not in this, because you get only one chance to make a good first impression. And so it's sometimes better to let go of an opportunity because startups, as you know, have very often a niche expertise. And so they want to wait for the opportunity that allows them to truly shine and, and uh, leverage their competence. But at the same time, on, the more on a more pessimistic note, to recognize that things can go wrong. The big company may pull the plug at any point. They have more options. They have more power, as you say. Um, you know, and even if they're not being unethical per se, uh, they can still walk away midway. And so to, to break the process into milestones so that even if the project stops midway, the startup has something to show for their efforts. Plus it allows a process of selective revealing. The challenge for the startup is to show enough for the big company to be interested, but no, not so much that the big company doesn't need them anymore. And then again, in terms of extending, you know, leveraging the, the relationship to extend it. So Testin is a startup in Beijing, or was a startup in Beijing that engaged with Microsoft in China. And then when they set up an office in San Francisco, they engaged with Microsoft in the US. Microsoft was very helpful for them to get some visibility early on. So that's the positive proactive side. But at the same time, don't assume that you will only work with one company, have options. And this is something this start company in Beijing did very well. They also engaged with Intel. They also engaged with Lenovo and they kept their options open. And so that's what I have found useful from the startup perspective. Thank you so much. I think, yes, I did recall my field work, you know, about those entrepreneurs, especially they actually aimed at exiting. So that's why they were purchased by the big corporations. And one of my long lasting longitudinal perspective did see that how those kinds of individuals, especially those, um, you know, original entrepreneurs who can really contribute a lot to bridge the two different identity firms and then try to work out. But then, you know, um, in the long term, it still needs certain kinds of mechanism and interface because you can't just rely on individual because if this particular person leaves the company, then it can be a totally different story. Um, thank you for that. Um, what do you think about what COVID might change or how the impact of COVID changed this kind of multinational firm and a small media sized firm corporation? Would we yeah, see totally different behavior? So, so this is a good question. So I showed a picture of a guy called Gregor Gimme, who uh, was a co-founder of the BMW startup uh, garage program. And I said, uh, his mantra was uh, seek forgiveness rather than permission. Well, he has since left BMW startup garage and set up his own consultancy uh, called 27 Pilots. And when COVID happened, he created a new initiative called startupsagainstcorona.com and basically helped to connect startups with big companies that were now having new pain points because of COVID, like, for example, the need for managing workforces remotely. So one of the big clients that signed up was uh, Lafarge Holsen, the big uh, Swiss cement company. And they ended up working with a startup from Pune, India. 
who had a solution to help them manage their workforce remotely. And one of the first places they established this was in Latin America. So actually, I think what one of the things that COVID has done clearly is to accelerate the adoption of digitalization by large companies in traditional areas that have been uh, industries that have uh, tended not to be very digital savvy. And from that perspective, it has in fact increased the opportunity set for startups to engage with large companies. Um, and I think also what happened during this pandemic period is somehow there's also been a lot of attention being turned towards climate change. And even though this was an issue that has been around for a much longer period of time, somehow the parallels between COVID and climate change and uh, ha have somehow, I think, drawn more attention to it. There's a greater sense of urgency and so on. And I, this is the other thing I'm observing during this period of COVID even though it's not directly related to COVID, somehow in parallel, sustainability seems to be now the new driver of collaboration between startups and big companies, where digitalization was say five, six years ago. And so these are a couple of things I've been observing. But of course, what the casualty has been the face-to-face -face interactions and, and except for China uh, and a lot of other parts of the world, now you find these accelerator programs have become virtual uh, and so on. So it's, it's wonderful that these things still go on. Uh, but I'm pretty sure something is lost in uh, not having these water cooler conversations and, and so on and meeting in person. Yeah, I think I share quite similar worry with you. But I, I think one of the most um, important features due to COVID, we have seen an increasing number of startups. So if we look at the figures about the registration of new business in the US, in the UK, and even in China, for the other emerging market, we can see lots of new business ideas, especially tailoring to the social needs, right? The lots of social entrepreneurial uh, ventures actually have boomed over the past two years, which is a quite exceptional feature um, under this point of the pandemic environment. But then definitely it takes much longer to see whether those kinds of venture ideas can survive at the first place and how they can be incorporated into the big business uh, landscape. Because most of the time, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about three pillars. We also have to think about economic and um, return of those kinds of small business and how to see how, how they will work out. And one part more questions is about more particular about China, to be honest, because I know you have been living in Shanghai for quite a long time and also the surrounding area. So you have seen, like you just mentioned, the boom of the B2B business and the B2C business in China, leading by those large digital um, giants like Xindong, like Alibaba and Xiaomi. So back to your general framework, what do you think any different practice between the relationship of startups and the large emerging economy multinational firms, let's put it this way, compared with you know, those kinds of traditional advanced economy like IBM, like Microsoft that you mentioned, because things definitely have changed dramatically over the past 20 years while at that time, large multinational firms from the European or from America dominated the market, right? When actually graduated from China, wanted to find their first job, the Microsoft, all those kinds of global fortune companies were always a priority. But now it seems a quite different picture. So what's your observation over your stay in China and your research there? So a couple of uh, observations. The first is that when you think about these large Western companies, then it feels as if they are less nimble, less agile. And one of the strong reasons they're looking at these startups is because the startups are, are very agile. But when you look at these large Chinese technology companies, they it feels like they're still very agile. So that's the first comment I would make. They, they are still moving very fast. I met someone who just moved from, uh, he's originally from China. He used to live in San Francisco and work for LinkedIn. And then he came back to China and he joined um, Tes uh, Tencent in Shenzhen. <laughs> and he was saying, uh, you know, I thought we moved pretty fast in Silicon Valley, but China is even faster. What would take four weeks in Silicon Valley, I'm expected to do in two weeks here. So, uh, so, so first of all, I would say that's a little bit um, different. Uh, but also, I think uh, VAT in particular have developed this role as corporate investors in a, in a way that's 
the, the relative importance of which is much greater compared to Silicon Valley. And I remember a couple of years ago reading this uh, report about uh, funding for startups in the US Corporate venture capital used to constitute only about 5%. Now that may change because now corporate venture capital has also had a boom, but in general, it was an important source, but not by any stretch of the imagination, the most important one. But in China, it's 40% of risk capital, nearly half, uh, and of, of which 90% comes from DAT. So the role of these big technology giants is very different. Um, so on the one hand, I think they themselves are seen to be moving quite fast, uh, but also they have this important role as investors. Uh, and there is a little bit of a Cold War kind of scenario where in, in any new area, uh, when two or three startups ultimately turn out to be the, the likely winners, one is usually backed by Ali, one is usually backed by Tencent, and maybe one by Baidu or something. And so that also, that there's that slightly different feel, which is once you get involved with one of these tech giants, it becomes difficult to engage with another, especially once you get the um, investment. But, be, but until you get the investment, actually startup entrepreneurs here seem to be very pragmatic. I met uh, an entrepreneur at a Tencent accelerator in Shanghai, and he was from Hangzhou. So I said, a mm, little bit odd, for me to see a Hangzhou entrepreneur here in Tencent, what happened at, did you not go to Ali? And in front of the Tencent manager, he was saying, yes, yes, I was initially working with Ali for a couple of months, but then they decided to stop the relationship. And so I came here. And so I looked at the Tencent guy and said, are you okay with that? And he said, yeah, I mean, it's okay. They can talk to, to anybody. So, you know, there's that pragmatism, that dynamism. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is, these are very um, interesting times to be seeing these dynamic ecosystems evolve and develop. Yeah, I think it's interesting because when we're talking about how fast the China's uh, or the Chinese market has been digitalized, and then, you know, especially those large digital giants, like you said, the kinds of exclu exclusive, right, in terms of the competition. So it's not surprising when the end financial wanted to actually go public last year and then it was suddenly actually got to pause because the government definitely gonna do something um, in order to regulate and then to provide more competitive environment rather than more closed um, certain kinds of more concrete. But also interesting thing is that when I talk to those kinds of more entrepreneurs or actually most of them actually they are serial entrepreneurs in China because this is quite different from the picture in, in, in the other countries because China now, um, seems to be more and more serial entrepreneurs in the market because that's what we're talking about, the network and their mm -hmm. mindset and also their experience will help the cooperation with large multinational firms. But at the same time, the whole environment seems to be a little bit squeezing them out because it will be very difficult for the small startups to actually stand on their own, even though they may have for, you know, certain kinds of a niche market to enter or super real technology, they have to work with those kinds of giants and they have to be partner ways. So this seems to what I have observed. Is that something that you discover as well in that market? So for sure, um, the, the, I think the importance of engaging with, with these uh, big company ecosystems, I think is certainly true. Uh, and I think these startups also have the options of engaging with uh, Western multinationals as well as these um, technology giants from China. And I mean, in, in many cases, they're able to do this in a, in a relatively complementary way. Uh, one of the startups from Shenzhen, uh, Yimian, which is into sort of, uh, they help big companies to, uh, to, to process their data and get insights out of the data. Uh, they were, uh, I met them because they were part of the Nissan Accelerator in Hong Kong, the Infinity Labs, but they had previously been in the Microsoft Accelerator, as well as in uh, one or two of these uh, BAT uh, type accelerators. And so it seems as if they've been able to find different benefits to get from these uh, different companies. Um, also, I think some of these Chinese startups that have engaged with um, international uh, companies have also found ways to uh, leverage the international networks of those companies. and. Uh, 
Uh, I mentioned Testin in Beijing, when they internationalized into the US, they tapped their relationship with Microsoft. Another startup uh, worked with Walmart in China to address one of their pain points in, in the retail outlets. And actually, Walmart was so impressed, they deployed that technology in uh, their US stores as well for a completely different pain point. In China, it was to address the hassle of buying loose uh, vegetables and fruit. You know, you have to go put the vegetable in a diet, in a plastic bag, stand in a line, uh, wait for an IE to weigh it and then put a, 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 a barcode. And these guys use their image recognition AI technology to develop a one-click solution. You can put the uh, plastic bag on a weighing scale and some images come up and you see the one that is relevant, you know, the particular vegetable or fruit. It's a one-click solution. You get a sticky piece of paper with the barcode and boom, you're, you're done. And Microsoft, uh, Walmart thought this is very good, not only for China, but also to solve a very different problem in America, which is in-store theft. So, I mean, for, for really sophisticated uh, startups in China um, and, and the ones that have learned to engage well with, with large corporations, uh, I think there are many opportunities. No doubt uh, there are uh, constraints uh, for various reasons, but there's still scope. And I do see skillful entrepreneurs engaging with big companies. Yeah, I think, thank you so much, Shemin, for your observation. And um, I think happens to this is a quite a phenomenon and I think we're so lucky to be able to live in this kind of fast changing mm. environment, not just like you in China or we in the Western world, because as I said, it's a global connected market and with lots of changing dynamics going on. And then which definitely create lots of for business opportunities for small business. Um, and I'm quite sure that the cohort will may have actually come up with some certain kinds of big ideas, right? Which we will see in near future. But the most important thing is that we have to recognize that the partnership is always important. While in the past we're talking about competition as the key drive for the marketization, but now we have seen more and more important thing is the cooperation. But definitely how to deal with the cooperation, how to deal with the partnership is always a difficult question, not for academic to evolve, but also especially for practitioners to experience over the years and because case by case and then you know different scenarios will change. So it will be such a fantastic talk for you to give us some of your, your ideas and your insights, and I really appreciate that. And I hope that the cohort also actually have a benefit from your talk. And we definitely look forward for more cooperation in person, you know, and in the post-COVID area. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to join you all. And yes, I really look forward to uh, meeting in person. Actually, um, maybe three, uh, three or four years ago, I had to um, um, examine a PhD. Uh, and uh, we actually ended up, uh, this was for someone from King's College London, but we ended up doing it at SOAS because the internal examiner was at SOAS then. And so uh, SOAS is such a fantastic institution and uh, I have uh, very high regard. And for my sins, I've actually in the past had to read a lot on social anthropology for some work that I did on how companies make strategy through uh, episodes, strategy episodes, and we used some ritual theory and I've, I've read a lot of work, uh, unusually uh, for an international business uh, person uh, from, from SOAS and uh, I, mean, I mean the core anthropology stuff, apart from the international business world mm -hmm. of people like you. So very privileged to have had this chance and I hope uh, people got some interesting nugget or two out of this and it was great to converse with you. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah sure definitely. We would like to welcome in person to SOAS campus, you know, on when days come. But um, thank you so much again. And then um, I think I'm going to end today's webinar and thank you everyone for your participation and for your attendance. And um, we'll come back with um, the next week's webinar and I hope you can see you guys again there. Bye.